I want to welcome to Rockfish Church today. Good morning. I'm Pastor Dan. I'm the senior pastor here. And more importantly, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And he's called us to do some incredible things in his day and in our lifetime. He wants you and me to be able to access the things of heaven and bring them to earth. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Now, the idea that God called us to pray and to connect with him and bring, as it's done in heaven, let it be done on earth. That we're conduits of that power. We're conduits of what he's created us to become, his children. And we are to every place we step to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ and the transforming power of his grace. So let's ask God to be with us, okay? Father, we pray as heaven touches earth that we realize you put us here for a reason. We're not here to to play church. We're not here to have good, wonderful lives. We are here to advance the kingdom of God in our day. Help us, Father, to know our place, to know where you've called us to be, and allow us, Lord, to make your name great. It's about you, Lord. Help our eyes to see you, not men, and help us, Father, to know you like we've never known you before. Protect us and keep us and watch over us in Jesus' name. You know, the title of the sermon is called God's Provision Through Prayer. God's provision through prayer. And when I think about this, what really immediately came to my mind was the idea that we somehow have making religion this uh, this prayer some kind of religious activity. It's not a religious activity. Well, it is, but it's more importantly, I want to call it connection. God is about connection. Prayer is you being able to pull down resources from heaven to do what he's called you to do in the earth in your day. You're a follower, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, you have a mark on you. You're called an adopted child of the living God. You're part of his plan in the earth. And your plan is to pull down, or his plan is to pull down the provision of God to give it to the world around you. So we're here for that reason. Prayer is not just a communication. It is a communication, but not just communication. It is the reaching into heaven and bringing supply to the need at the moment. Jesus Christ realized this, that when he came to the earth, that they had made it a religion. They had made it a function. It's just like, let's pray. And they were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They'd announce, they'd blow trumpets. So-and-so is going to pray now. And they would be given their alms with blasts of trumpets. And they were showing off their religiosity and the garments. And it was very liturgical, if you will. And, and Jesus Christ comes along to his disciples. He says, guys, I don't want you to pray this way. I don't want you to use meaningless repetition or rote words. I want you to connect to the Father. So he gave us something in the Lord's Prayer in chapter 6 of the book of Matthew. He says, I want you to pray then this way. And you know what we do? We make that the formula. And that was not the intention. Some of you know the Lord's Prayer could quote it. Some of you, especially from the Catholic persuasion, have used the Our Father over and over again. You hear it all the time. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And here's exactly what Jesus did not want us to do is to make it a formula. Basically, this is beginning of his ministry. He's just teaching his guys how to pray and how not to pray. And guess what we do? We turn around and do the exact thing he told us not to do. The Our Father, or the Lord's Prayer as we call it, is the basic outline that God has for you, the follower, to be equipped to connect, to bring resources to heaven, and to advance God's kingdom in the earth. That's why he gave us that prayer. You can see this act of non-being religious and bringing it into relationship, more importantly, bringing it into kingdom authority and power in the earth when Jesus gives us the prayer in full detail in John chapter 17. Remember, Matthew chapter 6 is the very beginning. But if you take Matthew chapter 6 and you look at what Jesus Christ told them to do in the Lord's Prayer and you put it over the top of the high priestly prayer, we call it, you will see it's exact same prayer. But all the details have been filled in. The high priestly prayer is when Jesus Christ got his disciples together. They, they came to the Lord's table. We call it the Last Supper. And he's up there and he's telling them a whole... I mean, it is everything. It's incredible. If you want to find out what you're supposed to be doing as a follower of Jesus, look at that portion of Scripture. 
He's talking to the disciples. This is what I want you to do. And then he starts praying. And, and when he prays this prayer, he totally unpacks everything that was in the original prayer, what we call the Our Father. It goes like this. John chapter 17, 1 through 26. Now, immediately after he does all this instruction to the disciples, washes their feet, he said, you have no idea what I just did to you. So he told them, you have no clue. He goes into the prayer, and then he immediately gets up, and he does a prophetic action. A prophetic action meaning this. He steps across a particular place, and that particular place then sets into motion the eternity and the things that are going to happen through the gospel of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that in just a moment. But that's in chapter 18. So here he is, giving all this to the disciples, that he gets up, and he does a prophetic action. And that action stands today. It is the reality that God of the universe is angry with the creation, but he provided a way of escape. And he says, I want you to know I'm giving you my son who will die on the cross for you if you accept the terms of your surrender. Otherwise, you are under the judgment of God. And that prophetic action that Jesus Christ did echoed through all of history. It goes all the way back into the book of Kings. We'll get to that in a minute. Let's look at the Lord's Prayer. I mean, the high priestly prayer, which is in folding, unfolding of the Lord's Prayer. It says, Jesus spoke these... By the way, before I go any farther, I have been listening to this song. Anybody know, ever heard of Hawk Nelson? Well, who's Hawk Nelson? Not a who, the man. And it says in there, it says this. Uh, I found this old CD cleaning out stuff. You ever clean stuff out, find an old CD? I found it, plugged it in. It's not really that old, but kind of old. And he, he sings, a, they sing a song on there. It's called, it says this thing, God, God paints outside the lines. We got lines for God. You will do it this way, God. He, he laughs. He, I'll paint over here. You're like, well, no, 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 in the line. He's not a first grader. He doesn't have to follow our lines, though. He does things outside the lines. He does things outside of what we expect sometimes. Kind of like, he kind of got you ready for that when he gave you marriage, you know? You went into marriage expecting something and it's outside the lines. I wasn't ready for this. And so we see marital problems a lot of times are trying to, people trying to get stuff back in the lines that are outside the lines. Well, that doesn't work very easily. In the prayer, he gets them outside the lines outside of the thinking of religiosity, back into what he originally wanted us to do. He starts off, Jesus spoke these things and lifted up his eyes to heaven. Sound familiar? Our Father who art in heaven. And we think when we pray, pray that we have to close our eyes. Where did we ever get that from? They didn't have cars back then, so some of you close your eyes when you pray. No, no. He said, look to heaven, looked up, and he prayed, Father, Father who art in heaven, or Father in heaven, the hour has come, glorify your Son. It's over. Ministry's done. He's about to be betrayed. He's about to go to the cross. This is the last words that he had. Father, the hour has come, glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. Even as you have given me authority over all flesh, that all that whom you have given me, I give them eternal life. It's all about eternal life. It's about this judgment of God on our world. It's about God's angry with His creation for turning its back on Him. He provides a way of escape. It's called eternal life. It is found only in Jesus Christ. Only if you come to Him. You have to accept His terms of surrender. I give you my life. I accept the cross. It's my, it was my punishment to put Jesus on the cross. I should have been the one on the cross, but you traded places with me. It's about eternal life. It's not about this life. We somehow got the idea that Jesus put the church here to give us a wonderful life. That is not why He put us here. He put us here for the purpose of redemption, to warn people to free from the wrath to come. It's about eternal life, and it's found only in Jesus Christ. He says that they might know the only true God. There's no other name, guys. And Jesus Christ, who is God, whom you sent. 
I glorified you on the earth, Jesus said, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. Do you realize that Jesus had a work when he came to the earth? You have a work on this earth to accomplish too. It's an eternal work. And it's not going to the army necessarily. It may have to do with that. But it has to do with what he's called you, the believer, the follower, to do. His kids to advance his kingdom in the earth. I glorified you on the earth, having accomplished the work which you gave me to do. Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself, that the glory which I had with you before the world was. He declared his deity one more time. I was in the presence and was God before there was a world. He said, I have manifested your name. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. He said, holy is your name. I have manifested your name to the men you gave me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now, they have come to know that everything you have given me is from you. For the words which you gave me, I have given it to them. They received them and have truly understood that I have come from you. And they believe that you sent me. I ask on their behalf. I do not ask on behalf of the world but those whom you have given me, for there they are yours. And all things are mine, that are mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I have been glorified in them. Kingdom authority, thy kingdom come. I will no longer be in the world. And yet they themselves are in the world. I come to you, Holy Father, Keep them in your name. Hallowed be thy name. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. I have kept them in your name that they may be one even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name which you have given me. And I guarded them and none of them perished but the son of perdition so that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, Father, And these things I speak in the world so they may have my joy be made full in themselves. I have given them your word. You know what? The Bible says that the word of God is the bread of God. Jesus is known as the word of God. He's known as the bread of God. You ever prayed this prayer? Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. He's not talking about mustard on your bologna sandwich. He's talking about the provision to do what he's called you to do and become. He's talking about the bread of heaven. You ever, you ever done something for God or let God use you and the power that it went through you and you saw a miracle happen or you saw somebody get healed? Isn't it great to have that feeling that God used you to do something? And that's when Jesus was out talking to the woman of the well and they came up and said, hey, you want some food, Jesus? He said, I have bread you don't have a clue about. God has given me my daily bread. It's to do the will of my Father in heaven. And he was talking to that lady. He was getting nourished. The last thing you care about when you're doing something for God is what you're having to eat. You don't worry about it. it doesn't, you don't care anymore. It's like, I just love to do what God called me to do. And I, you can forget to eat. I, it's possible. Your bread is the Word. Give us this day our daily bread. Give us that moment with you. Give us that connectivity with you. It says, it says I have given them your Word. Listen to this. And the world hates them. The world hates you. If you're a follower, the world hates you. I didn't write it. He wrote it. The world hates you because you stand for Jesus Christ and the truth. And I'm not saying beating people up with the Bible, but what I am saying is it is coming almost this close. This close for me to say the truth of the Word of God in our world today to where it's illegal. This close. If we keep sitting in the pot, getting heated up like a frog, it won't be long to where it will be illegal for me to teach you what this book says. Because this book says this to you. If you, if you conduct sexual activity outside of the covenant of the marriage between a man and a woman, you are in sin and God hates it. That's what it says. I didn't write it. 
And God says, I do not want you to live in that. And I, there's all forms of sexual immorality. But we cannot compromise. That's an example. We cannot compromise that because, oh, well, you can't hurt somebody's feelings. I am telling you to flee from the wrath to come. I'm not trying to make a, some kind of social statement. This is an eternal statement. Adulterers. Feminists. It says they won't inherit the kingdom of heaven, so what do we do with that? Write it out of the book? Get rid of it? Sorry, not as long as I live. You might think I'm a hater. You go say it's illegal to say that, but I'm gonna, well, I guess I go to jail. I can't compromise what he told me to teach you because that's what the Bible... There's no way to twist it! Not without rewriting it! And that's what they're trying to do. Anyway, he said the world hates him. You don't think the world hates you? You wait and watch what happens over the next few years. We are very fortunate in our country very, very fortunate that I can get up and tell you the truth. But how long would that last? Until they start taking our air conditioners and our fun away. All right, enough of that. The world has hated them because they are not of the world. See, my allegiance is not in... I'm, a, I'm an American. I love the United States of America. I love this country. I think it's the greatest country on the planet. But ultimately, I'm a citizen of heaven. Ultimately, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of God. I have one king, one authority, and that's who I follow. And when it transgresses any earthly power or any earthly authority, I have to side with him. Makes the world hate us. Jesus said, I don't ask you to take them out of the world. But I ask you to keep them from the evil one. You ever heard of that? Deliver us from evil? Doesn't that sound familiar? Keep them from the evil one. Deliver them from evil. Deliver us from evil. And then he goes on to say this. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For their sakes I sanctify myself. That means set myself apart. That they themselves also might be sanctified, set apart in truth. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, in case you just think that this is all on them, all on the twelve, like the twelve are going to be massacred for their faith. But that doesn't count for us because we're Americans. I do not ask on these alone, but for those who believe in me, Jesus, through their word. Anybody believe in Jesus through somebody else's word? Yes. Counts you in. That they all might be one. You know what the greatest travesty in the Christian church is today? There's a lot of them. You know what the worst is? Unforgiveness. Well, they should never talk to me that way. I'll tell you what, I don't like you because you hurt my feelings. And since I'm going to present my altar up here, or my offering up here, you need to go to a different service. You go to third, I go to first. And it's your wife, you know? That's not good. <laughs> we live in a culture of unforgiveness where it's okay to unfor not to forgive people. Jesus said, forgive us our sins as we forgive others. It's a curse. Forgive us our sins the way we forgive other people. Okay. Forgive, the reason why forgiveness is so important is like, well, you just need to do it because it's the right thing to do. Jesus said it this way, that they all might be one. Unity. Oneness comes through forgiveness, not brokenness, not gossip, not Hatred, it comes from forgiveness, forgiving one another as your Father in heaven has forgiven you. Even as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us. That the world might believe you sent me. Unity. That the glory which you have given me, I've given to them, and they have become one. That's what God wants. That's why we forgive to be one in unity. Just as they are one. doesn't mean we agree with everything. It just means that if we got a problem with someone, we were supposed to go to them. If you present yourself to the altar and you realize someone's got something problem with you, you're supposed to go to them. We don't do that. Matthew 5, Matthew 18, we don't do that. We say, well, I got every right to be mad at you. I'll go worship my God. He's like, sorry. When, when, do, we re when do we really think that religion, or this thing had to be about us? Because we're Americans? I mean, you know, we come in here. How many times is it? I didn't like worship today. I just didn't like it. I didn't like that song. Well, I didn't know we were worshiping you. 
We make it about us. When do we get a little humility and say, we really messed stuff up and we need forgiveness like that? I've messed up. I've had more trouble with electronics today. I don't need this. All right. He goes on to say, you have loved me before the foundation of the world because his kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Your kingdom come, your will be done. I know you, God. I know you, my Father. These things, and these have come to know you, that you have sent me. And I've made your name known to them. And I will make it known to them that the love with which you've loved me may be in them and I in them. The Lord's Prayer opened up in the high priestly prayer. Then Jesus Christ goes and makes a prophetic statement. He does this. He gets up after he washed their feet, told them all the instructions, prays to their Father in heaven, the whole Our Father, he prays the whole thing and why it means that. And then he gets up, and it says, read it, he walks across the Kidron Valley. In the Kidron Valley, when he takes a step across, he steps into the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane is on the other side of the Kidron Valley. Now, get to my notes here if I can find them. Kidron Valley points back to 1 Kings. The story in 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 37. Basically what happened then was that David was the king and he turned everything over to his son Solomon. And when he turned it over to Solomon, there was an uprising. There was disloyalty. There was, there was all kinds of subversion happening. And back then when a king got under that kind of a problem, his best way to do that is annihilate his enemies because you can't have that. You've got to have unity. He knew how important it was. Matter of fact, it was some of his own relatives, some of his own kin. And, and matter of fact, one of them was rising up against Solomon and said, I should have been king, not you, and he killed him. Because they can't have that. And one of the guys, Solomon went to him, look, I want you, to re I want you here. I don't want you messing up. I, I, want, you to, I want you to stay put, and I'm, I'm warning you right now. And then he gives him this warning. He says in 1 Kings Chapter 2, verse 37. On the day that you go out and cross over the brook of Kidron, you will know for certain you shall surely die and the blood, your blood, will be on your own head. In other words, don't cross that. Don't cross that. Don't do that. Don't go into that place. When Jesus Christ went across that thing, two things happened. Number one, he was going to die. He's going to give his life as a ransom for many. The second thing was anyone who was on the wrong side of Kidron was going to be eternally lost, and your blood will be on your own hands. It's a signal. It's a prophetic action. The Kidron Valley. The question is today, which side of the valley are you on? You need to get on the side with Jesus. You need to be with him because you're crucified in Christ. It's taken care of. Our Father who art in heaven... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread. Deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Forgive us our sins the way we forgive other people. Wow, what a, what a statement. And in that moment, Jesus was betrayed. In that moment, Jesus began the start or the beginning of the end. You know, we sit here in our country and our nation, and we, we have it pretty good. And I got some news recently from a group of people. You know, we've been working in Iraq, Operation IKE and all that. We, we've been working. We've actually helped rescue 10,000 orphans so far out of the Syrian war and out of the ISIS invasion and all that and killing these, these, their parents. They kill their parents to get the kids. They take the kids and they train them how to strap bombs on, hate Americans, and sell their bodies for sex. They train them to do that so that they can take over the world, to so amass an army using children. They do it through orphans. Well, <clears throat> recently, 
I got word from the field that these workers that are working, I mean, they're, they're giving their life. They're, they're serving Jesus. And they've been working with the orphans. And what they do with the orphans, they bring them in, they give them trauma, de-trauma training, you know, trauma counseling, if you will. They move them out of that. They give them life skills training. And then they move them into discipleship programs. So they try to make these little jihadists into Christians now. And the ones that become Christians will change their nation. So they're kind of doing the reverse of what the Muslims are trying to do. Well, I don't know if you've been following the news whatsoever. Um, you probably found New Zealand in the news because they'll hear a lot about that, but you won't hear about what I'm about to tell you. As the United States ramps up is its plan to annihilate ISIS and get rid of it, which is a good thing, right, to get rid of the bad guys. But as they get rid of the bad guys, the problem is there's these orphans that are left behind. So recently what happened, oh, one of the families that was serving these orphans and working to bring them to the saving knowledge of Christ and to change the whole nation um, and to work that direction. Uh, they were targeted by a radical Islamic group and they went into their house and they murdered the dad, murdered the mom, murdered the three children, and murdered his brother. These are people that we work with. These are people that we are in contact with. They're murdered for their, fa for their faith and for what they're trying to do. Well, there's 40 other people that are working the same kind of plan. Who knows, because there's been an infiltration by some traitor, that they're, they're on the hook too now. So they're running, you know, they're trying to, so they have to move stuff. But they, I would be getting a plane ticket out of there. That's what I'd be doing. Not them. How are you going to leave the orphans? You're going to leave 10,000 orphans or plus or more? So what they're doing is they're moving things around. They've got to re reroute stuff and make stuff happen. Well, <laughs> this time the United States ramps up its attack on ISIS again and they just recently recent really recent found some compounds that house orphans that are being taught to strap bombs on hate Americans sell their bodies and and lie to people to get what they need and they've got all these these people well, what happened is they got rid of ISIS ISIS is gone they're either captured dead or on the move but now, the, as these groups of people are moving for their lives and trying to keep their orphans together and trying to make all this work, all of a sudden, pff, there's 610 more orphans that have been in these training camps. Now they're out, and now they've got them in their control. Now, the urgent cry came to me, and I'm not trying to pull your arm here or pull your pocketbook or nothing, but they came to me, Dan, we need to pray for these people. We need to pray for these people. This is serious business, and they don't have any food for them. So they're on the run. they got no food. they got no place to shelter all these guys, but yet they've been strapped down with 610 more orphans immediately like that. And if you can, give to that. Put Operation I Key on it. Do that. You know, there's, there's little containers up here in the back. You can go online and give. I, I'm not, I'm, that's not what I want to do here today. I just want you to know I have a heart for that. We are going to feed those babies. We're going to do it. And I'd like you to be a part of that, okay? You, you do that however you can do that. Um, but I was going to take up an offering and all that, but it's just, you just if it doesn't touch you, I'm not going to coerce you because we're out of touch with it anyway. But my point is they're willing to give their lives for something. that we have a verse of Scripture that we use all the time, Romans 8, 28. It says this, For God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God and call according to His purposes. All things work together for good, Right? My water heater went out, and I was up working on it late last night, and then I had a toothache. I couldn't go to sleep last night, so I'm running on a little low energy here. Okay, is that good? No. But in the middle of all this, there's a, a pastor that came from Egypt who's an on-fire Christian that went into Iraq to help this situation. And he wrote back, he wrote, it's in Christianity Today, you can read it, it's open source. In Christianity Today, he says this statement. He said, I've been working in Iraq for 20 years sharing the gospel with the Muslim people to see conversion. And in 20 years, you know how many people came to Christ? One. He said, today, now, right now, I speak to 2,000 people a day that want to hear about the love of Jesus Christ. And you know what they say when they come to Christ? Listen to this. This will blow you away. Romans 8, 28. We thank God for ISIS. Because if ISIS has not done what they did, we've never seen how horrible this, 
this Islamic thing was, and we would have never come to know the saving knowledge of the loving Jesus Christ. That's Romans 8.28. It's not, well, somehow I get a good parking place at Walmart when I drive up. Jesus Christ called you and me to call down provision from heaven to advance God's kingdom in the earth at all costs. I will give you a little prediction. United States of America is headed for a real tough thing. And I don't want to have to stand up here and say, I thank God for for ISIS coming to our country. I thank God for 9-11s. I don't want to say that. I can't say that. God will do whatever He has to do with you and me to get His gospel to the ends of the earth. Every dark, nasty, vile corner there is, He's going to get His people from every tongue, tribe, and nation. And He's looking for people willing to say, whatever it takes, I'll do it. And you can say that all day long. Two years ago, about two years ago now, actually started before that, but two years ago it became very apparent that God was speaking something to my heart that's really, really super, super important today for you. And, and I'm a radical. I love Jesus. I want to take Jesus. I want Jesus to be everything. You know what? I tell you all the time, I didn't die for nobody in this room. Not about this guy in this pulpit up here. It's not about that. It's about us going forward with the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the world. That's what we do. About two years ago, I was challenged by God because I had some health issues. And I was looking at it, and I was just praying about God. I love Rockfish Church. And, and in the beginning, um, we started about, oh, I think it was 27 years ago. It used to be called Rayford Christian Fellowship. Eleven families got together and had a church out here. And I was just part of the leadership then. I just come out and have this little church thing. Cool, we do church, right? Sing some songs, worship from God, take up a collection, no problem. Um, and then two years into the, the process of that church plant, our senior pastor, Joe Rodriguez, uh, had a heart condition, triple bypass surgery. Doctor said, you cannot be planting churches and doing the stressful part of what you're called to do. So God says, I want you to do it, Pastor Dan. And you know my story. I, I, I never wanted to be a pastor. I mean, I never, that's, I, I want to take the gospel where it's never been. I want people's lives transformed. So I said, God, I really struggle with this thing. I said, God, how do I do this? I'll do what you tell me to do. And I don't get it because I'm not really wired to be a pastor. I'm an introvert. No, that doesn't mean I hate people. It just means that, I, never mind. I'm not energized by people all the time. And I have some alone time to have to do. But so I thought, okay, okay. Then he put this idea. So it was right for Christian Fellowship. And then I said, well, who are we? Why are we here? And I went through this whole process. If you ever even hear the story, starting point class, we talk about it in there, how this happened. And I'm like, okay, uh, uh, Lord, can the church not be any bigger than 250? Please. I talk about why I said that. Now, but then he said, you don't have that choice. I love people. I said, yeah, I know you do because you're, you're crazy. He's crazy about people. He loves people. He'll do whatever. I said, okay, God, could it be healthy? Could the church just be healthy? Could we just do that? I mean, like, really be healthy. Well, he showed me some things through a process, and the leadership went through some things, and we said, okay, we had to relaunch this church and change it from Rayford Christian Fellowship to a new identity. And this is 12 years ago, we launched Rockfish Church. We launched it with a new vision, a new direction. We're going to use the military because that legitimized me. We're going to use the military to send people all over the world with the gospel. I'm in that. I'm in it. We can do that. And I said, please let it be healthy. The problem with healthy things is they grow. So it keeps growing. I'm like, okay. And I realize that I'm not responsible for every single person's religious, spiritual experience and walk in here. That's not my job. It's your job. My job is to equip you to do it. Okay, so I'm good. I'm good now. I'm, don't go on. I'm good. I'm good. I've been the senior pastor here for 25 years. And, I've wa and here's what it's like. I don't, you've never been that or seen that. Uh, you may not know what it feels like. It feels like you, you have a little girl. She's my girl. Rockfish is a girl. She's, she's going to marry God. You know that, right? She's a body of Christ as a girl. And it, sometimes my wife thought it was the other woman. No, it's my daughter. You don't get weird here. But in helping her grow up, she grows up. 
You don't remember when Nikki left, you know? She had to go and live her life. And if you have little girls in your house or a guy, you realize that day's coming. And they're not always going to be there for you. They're not always your little girl. And so, so I've been doing this for, 20, for 25 years as a senior pastor, and I'm, I'm going along. And two years ago, God really made it clear to me, you need to get your daughter ready to fly. What? You know, the picture kicking her out of the nest thing? Uh, you get her ready to fly. And I started thinking about, well, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do this? How do you want? And, and it became so crystal clear to me, and it hurt me to the, it cut me deep. He said, Dan, you're, you're in the way. You're, you, you, you're, you're dad. You're not husband anymore. You need to give her to me. I said, okay, I'll give her to you. What do you want me to do? How do you want me to do that? And so the process went something like this, and I've grieved it, walked through it, and I realized that I am kind of the lid to this thing, and she can't grow any farther until I step aside. And in saying stepping aside, what I'm saying is that as you're, as a senior pastor of Rockfish Church, um, this Tuesday I'll be giving my resignation for the position of C- CEO and senior pastor, grand poopa, whatever, uh, to the leadership of the church. What this does not mean is I'm not going anywhere. I'm like a, I'm just not going anywhere. I am stepping aside so she can step up, and and so. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be here. I'm not retiring. But here's the problem. I'm almost 65, and if we do what God's called this church to do, which is amazing, number one, I want to be a part of it. But number two, I realize that I can't get in the middle of that thing and then fall apart on you. She's got to go. She's got to move forward. And so I went to the leadership, and I told them, look, I really feel this, and I, I want you to keep it under wraps. That's why I didn't tell anybody. We didn't talk about it because it's just like weird, you know. Um, and I said, you know, Tuesday I'll be doing that. And so the leadership of the church, was, we'll bring them up here in just a moment. And these are the people that decide the direction of Rockfish Church. Now, these people, I'll talk about it starting point today. We're on that very class. How do we decide to do what we do? I don't make this decision. And I'm not in the sense of who's going to take my spot. It's a leadership's decision. But God spoke very clear to me. He gave me a gift. So I went to the leadership and I talked to him about this and I said, you know what, this is what I really need to do. This is not fun. This is not funny. This is not easy. This is one of the hardest things. But I will do whatever I got to do to follow Jesus. I'll do whatever he tells me to do. So as I step aside, I'm not going anywhere. Repeat after me. Dan's not going anywhere. Dan's not retiring. Dan's going to work harder like an idiot. And I am here to make the name of Jesus spectacular. So what the leadership had decided to do, that when I step aside, the successor is going to be a younger person that can take this thing even farther. And, and the lot had fallen to Tony. Now, the person that God told me was the gift was Tony. But it's their decision, not mine. So what we're going to do is we're just basically the person steering the ship is going to change. I'm going to be over here, and I'm going to be de- developing people to go further than they ever thought they could go. I'm going to be tapping people in this room on the shoulder. Hey, I need your help. I need you to do this. And it's going to be like, what? Yeah. You're supposed to do the ministry, not me. We're all supposed to do this together. And as I step into that position to develop people and to build strategies and infrastructures and scaffolding teams and all this stuff, we're going to take the gospel farther and farther than whatever it is. We're going to do it locally. We're going to do it regionally. And we'll do it throughout the world. That's what we're going to do. It's time for the church to step up and fly. And I know for some people it's not comfortable. But guys, I trust these leaders with my life, obviously. But I also trust Jesus in them because Jesus is doing this, not me. So I want the leaders to come up, and we're just going to pray for our church. We're talking about prayer. We're talking about provision. God has provided. Church is in your great place. I'm not in trouble. This is my thing, okay? (laughs) Pastor Dan must have done something really bad. No, (laughs) no. I'm not. I'll be in the pulpit. You'll still see me. You can't get rid of me. You know, I've got a bad penny. Come on. But the person who's going to steer this ship has got fire in his bones. And it's going to take some gumption. It's going to take some fire to go to the next level. 
And it's going to take, it's going to take a lot of work to make that happen. And we're going to make the name of Jesus spectacular. That's what we've always been doing. That's what we do. And you know what? When I think about what we're doing, this is like, compared to what they, they're doing in Iraq, it's like, okay. They'd be like, really? That's hard. We just lost a family and we're still, you know what I'm saying? In contrast, it's like Jesus will do whatever it takes to reach the people. There are giftings in here. There are callings in here. There's pastors in here. There's teachers in here. There's elders in here. More deacons. There's more everything in here. Worship leaders. All kinds of stuff. And they've got to step up now. We're going to fly. We're going to fly. And these young, get up here, Dustin. Where are these young guys? Nathan's up here. These young guys. They, pray for them. I had it easy. The world hates us. It's not going to get easier. And we get to take hold of the funnest thing that you can ever imagine, being part of the kingdom. Being able to take what Jesus Christ gave us and call our Father who art in heaven. You're holy. Get in His name. Do what He's called you to do. Even if it's uncomfortable and not fun. Thy kingdom come. It's about His kingdom. Your will be done. When we make it about a guy in this pulpit up here, we're doing the wrong thing. It's about the Jesus in heaven who loves us. We're just his kids. We're just brothers in Christ. We know where to get some bread. So I'm going to have Tony or uh, Mark. You got a microphone? Oh, good. He's got green on too, so he's good. All right, come on up. He's just going to pray with us. We just need to pray, right? We gather together and just pray that God would take us further than we've ever been before. And it's going to happen. It's not easy, but it's going to happen. Guys, as, um, as we pray, you're part of this church. You're, you're part of this body. This is the leadership here, but this church wouldn't be here without you guys and without Jesus. We've got to keep putting him first. So we're going to pray a blessing on this, on this whole transition on Rockfish Church right now. So if you'll agree as we pray uh, that we would never lose sight of him and that we would continue to hear him and follow him and be that church, that body that he has called us to be. So, Father, mm. Lord, I want to thank you for Dan and his heart to follow you, to be that man of God that you've called him to be. That wife has come along beside him, Jan, Lord. <laughs> Lord, I want to thank you for their hearts to go after you and chase after you and go where you've called them to go and be what you've called them to be and for Rockfish to be what you've called it to be, Lord. Lord, I pray, God, that you would continue to pour your blessings on this church. Mm. Pour your blessings into to Dan and Jan. And, Lord, I pray, God, that you would just, that you would lead us, that you would guide us, that you would strengthen us to do what you've called us to do, to go where you've called us to go and be what you've called us to be. Lord, united. Hmm. Lord, that you would hmm. still be at the front of hmm. every decision that we make and that you would be the reason we do what we do, the reason we wake up, the reason we sleep, hmm. the reason we go out into the world, Father. Hmm. Lord, I pray, God, that you would bless this family. And I know this is not an easy thing that Dan does. I know it's not. But, Lord, I think he hears you. I know he hears you, Lord. And we've all followed him completely. But, Lord, we're following you first. So, Lord, I pray, God, for your blessing on this. Bless Rockfish Church. Bless the hands that it would take to put to the plow to take your, your girl, your woman, your lady, your church, forward, Father. Mm. Lord, we ask and we agree in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. We'll never forget that. Lord, we love you and we thank you for this opportunity to be a part of your kingdom and go forward in your name. In the name of Jesus, we do pray and we ask. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. you guys.
pray for the leadership continually. And um, our job, is according to the scripture in Ephesians 4, is to equip the body to do the work of service. That's our job. We're here to get the bride of Christ ready for Jesus to return. And he's coming back for a beautiful bride without spot or blemish. So another thing, I want to go back to that thing about unforgiveness. If you have a problem with somebody, you've got to go to them and get it right, okay? Make sure you maintain unity, the perfect bond of peace and unity. But that's so important. The body of Christ won't go forward unless we're one man. So I know it's hard, some of the stuff we've talked about. And it's probably let, let it soak in a little bit. Just remember, Dan's not going anywhere Dan's not retiring. As a matter of fact, I'm going to be working harder probably than ever. i got a new boss besides Jesus. Um, and we're going to take this thing. We're going to push it. I'm going to push from the back as hard as I can push. And I know Tony's going to drive from the front as hard as he can drive. I got it. And I know he loves us. And I know that, that God's put people in our place. We've got great pastors around us. I'm still a pastor. I still love Jesus more than ever. And I want to see his name made as great and as big as we can make it. So if I tap you on the shoulder, you don't want to get around me in the next little bit because if you're not ready to say, I'm ready, let's go do it. You know, I'll be like, what do you want? Oh, I want to come and sit in church on Sunday one service would be good. I said, let the dead bury the dead. I'm going on. We're going to find people ready to take this gospel kingdom and teach their brains out and learn how to do stuff for Jesus and make his name bigger and go farther than we ever had before. Okay? The only people really going to hurt the worst of the staff. No, I'm just, you know, they got a new boss. This is, no, this is different. It's hard. We've never done this. It's 25 years. I've been Papa. <laughs> okay, go get married, you know. Go, go, go live your life. You know, go do what Jesus has called you to do. And that's the releasing part of all this. I think it's going to help us. I think it's going to stir the pot a little bit to where we go further than ever we had before. And these young guys, gotta, you got to pray for them. Get these guys going. Pray for Tony. Pray for Nathan. Pray for Dustin. These guys... These guys got to be on their game because that world's getting rough. And Jesus is coming back. As soon as this gospel of the kingdom is preached, the world is a witness to all nations. He's coming back. And that's what I want. I want him coming back. I'm done with this place. How about you? Will you stand with me? We'll close. Father, as you sent your son to die on the cross for us, and you said to pick up your cross every day and to follow you and Lord, any but or whatever, all that, Father, we just got to lay that down because there's no time for that. We have to be 100% followers of Jesus, 100% not entangled into the affairs of everyday life and getting ourselves all messed up with the world system, but be free to do and to go and to become and to, to encourage one another. Father, help, help everyone in here to walk in a unified fashion through unforgiveness and grace and mercy the same way we've been shown it. For yours is the kingdom, yours is the power, and yours is the glory. And let us sow our lives into your purpose and your plan in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.